Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. Very glad to be joined today by one of my friends and favorite authors, uh, Father Dan Horan, who is a Franciscan priest and theologian. He's, among other things, the director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame. He's a columnist for the National Catholic Reporter. He's the author of 14 books, I think, maybe this is 15 now, uh, on theology, Franciscan spirituality, uh, Catholic social teaching, uh, racial justice, many other things. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to be talking with him today about his uh, latest book for Orbis, which is called Engaging Thomas Merton, Spirituality, Justice, and Racism. And I'm very excited about this because, uh, for my money, uh, Dan is one of the most perceptive and interesting uh, scholars and writers on Thomas Merton, the great Trappist uh, monk who's writing some spirituality and interreligious dialogue and social issues are are still so uh, demand so much attention uh, to today. And what I I really like about this book, uh, among other things, is that it it has something for everybody. It really is a, a book that could serve as an introduction, I think, for people who are learning about uh, Merton for the first time. Uh, it also has all kinds of nuggets there of, of really interesting and uh, uh, lucid uh, insights uh, into aspects of Merton's thought that are not usually uh, 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 considered. And also spends a lot of time focusing on on Merton's relevance to contemporary uh, developments, both in the church and, and in the wider society. So it's really a compendium of some of his greatest hits, I think, uh, but it's uh, uh, but a, really a book, I think, for everybody who was interested in Merton. And I, I liked it in the in the beginning when you said that uh, Merton was kind of, for you, a hobby that got out of control. <laughs> and, but uh, you you have you have uh, chapters in the beginning where you specifically write about well why should anybody be interested in Merton uh, what does he have to say to us uh, today so I think maybe that's a, a really good way to welcome you and and ask you to talk about uh, answer that question for us maybe sure sure well Robert it's it's always a pleasure to be with you and I I echo um, what a joy it is to be with it with a friend and a, and a colleague and one of my favorite editors if I'm one of your favorite authors you're definitely one of my favorite editors um and so it's 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 really a joy I'm 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 also excited about this book and and, and hearing you kind of reflect some of the themes that that are so kind of meaningful to you and that you see as as useful to others or resonant with with others um makes me very very happy because I what I say in the introduction is exactly right. As you recount, um, people often ask me, how did I get interested in Thomas Merton? Um, why Thomas Merton, this sort of thing. And, and I, my sincere response is he's a hobby that grew out of control. Like a lot mm -hmm. of folks, I was mm -hmm. drawn to Merton because of, uh, just my own personal spiritual reading. He, I found his work compelling, challenging, inspiring, at times frustrating, um, and is really one of the greatest, uh, kind of, spiritual masters and authors of the of the 20th century certainly in the u.s context but i would say globally as well um he yeah he was certainly somebody who captivated my own attention and from there uh, i found myself being asked to lead retreats and to uh, write essays and, and and book chapters and eventually some books about about merton himself and so that's the out of control part. It started as, as spiritual reading and led to um, a whole area of academic and, and popular interest. Um, but your question about like, why is Merton still relevant? That is that is the question. And, and if I may, I just want to share a little anecdote that's well known in Merton circles. And I think those who are familiar with, um, you know, your, your great, uh, you know, uh, champion Dorothy Day, um, folks who are familiar with Pope Francis's 2015 addressed to the joint session of Congress, where he lifts up, in addition to Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton as these great Americans. Um, one of the things that's that was fascinating about that exchange, uh, or not, not exchange, but this presentation on the Holy Father's part, is that um, just about a decade earlier, maybe just a little bit more than a decade earlier, the USCCB was uh, working on an edition of an American catechism for adults. And at that time, Bishop Donald Wuerl was the, the general editor of that process. And in each of the chapters, the sections of the catechism, they had an American saint or blessed or spiritual figure um, that kind of 
was was an was a kind of introduction for readers. So you know, a Dorothy Day or Elizabeth Ann Seton um, might be in there. And then Thomas Merton was one of the people who was originally included or proposed. And in the end, uh, Bishop Whirl, now Cardinal Whirl, um, took Merton out of the contention, out of running, and said, among other reasons, that he felt as though Merton was not well known among young people, young adults, and that maybe he wasn't as relevant anymore, and therefore um, shouldn't be included. So fast forward a little more than a decade, the Pope is standing in his Archdiocese of Washington and, and explicitly identifying Merton as somebody um, who is relevant. And I've always loved that because uh, our, our Archbishop Cardinal Whirl was sitting there right in front of Pope Francis hearing this in real time. <clears throat> but, you know, contrary to that assumption back in the uh, mid 2000s, when then Bishop Whirl said he wasn't as relevant, um, I, I would argue that there are kind of perennial themes in, in Merton's life that makes him especially relevant. The first one is he is is fully human. His humanity is on display. And so unlike um, a lot of other figures lifted up for Christian veneration and, and held up as models of Christian living that are oftentimes kind of reduced to a, a whitewashed hagiography, right? We talk about maybe they were sinners at a young age and then they became these like tremendously holy people and did this, that, and the other. In Merton's case, we see throughout his life both really a great sense of holiness and, and commitment to prayer and to dialogue and contemplation. At the same time, we see somebody who made mistakes and who struggled and who owned his own sinfulness and owned his own imperfection. He's somebody who sought and modeled a life of um, of, of solitude and, and quiet and uh, kind of withdrawal from the world. And at the very same time he's doing that, he becomes more and more engaged in the concerns of society, of justice, of um, those who are struggling or are otherwise subjugated in the world. So, you know, he, he's, he is a bit paradoxical. Some have described him that way. But I think, especially for today's young people, um, and not so young people alike, his his kind of straightforward related relatability is what makes him, you know, most um, relevant today. It's hard to find Christian <clears throat> figures who are as relatable. I think I think Day is an, another example of somebody who um, fits that bill. But but that's high on on my list for Merton. It's uh, going back to that, uh, that 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 question that Cardinal Whirl had about him. Not only did he say that oh, young people don't know about who he is today, or maybe maybe the implication that better better off that they don't know who he is. Uh, but he also said, we, there are a lot of questions we have about where he was going at the end of his life. And you know, he goes off to Asia and he's interested in Asian religion. And the implication was that he was leaving Christianity behind. And that uh, was another thing that made the Pope's remarks in Washington, I think, so striking, maybe with Whirl in the, in the audience there, is because the thing that, that Whirl was, or other you know, people might be concerned about, where was he going? That's exactly what the Pope uh, focused on. I'll, I, I'll quote that. What does he said? He said uh, he was a thinker who challenged the certitudes of his time and opened new horizons for souls and for the church. He was also a man of dialogue, a promoter of peace between peoples and religions. So that theme that he was, yeah, he was a guy who was going out there to the frontiers. That's exactly, you know, what he has to say to us. You had a number, you have a number of chapters in the book where you specifically relate Merton uh, to the agenda or the thinking spirituality of Pope Francis. Uh, so it was no coincidence there, you know, mistake, just odd thing that he should bring up uh, Merton. What do you see as some of those kind of, of parallels or connections? Well, I think there, I'll, I'll name three, and, and I focus particularly on these three elements in the book. One is um, they have a very similar sense of holiness. What is holiness? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's amazing reading <clears throat> Merton his understanding of the universal call to holiness, something he had begun thinking about and writing about and teaching his, his brother monks and uh, those he corresponded with, um, even before the Second Vatican Council's uh, dogmatic uh, constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium, which, which stated unequivocally that all women and men, regardless of their state of life, religious, ordained, lay, married, single, that everybody was called to holiness. So he spent a lot of time right from the outset of his his own ministry and reflection and in his writings, making that point. Um, Pope Francis, if we fast forward about a half a century later, 
also goes back at this point after Lumen Gentium, but reiterates this point of the universality, the universal call, the vocation to holiness. And what is striking about both of them is that their sense of holiness is not about individual achievement. And mm -hmm. I think for Pope Francis especially, that's that's a very important theme <clears throat> because there is, I would argue, a kind of almost neo-neo-Pelagianism for, for those who are watching who may not be familiar with Pelagius uh, or a Pelagianism, this idea that that we can do everything on our own, right? And, and this is an oversimplification, but maybe in contrast to somebody like Augustine who said, everything we do that's good comes from the grace of God, right? It's the Holy Spirit working with uh, with us and in us, uh, enabling us, giving us the condition of the possibility of goodness or, or charity or these sorts of things. And so Pope Francis really shines a light on that for the modern world, which is there's a lot of self-righteousness, especially in the digital age. There's a lot of um, folks, <laughs> speaking of the Pope, who think they are holier or more Catholic than the Pope himself. And, uh, and, and a lot of kind of, you know, polarized battles, um, both in the civil sphere and in our church, around who is right, who is wrong, who deserves to be included, who's excluded. And both Pope Francis and Merton have this sense of holiness as participating in God's divine life. So this call is something shared by all. It's it's not about perfection. It's not about individual accomplishment. Um, and they really have resonances. In fact, in reading some of Pope Francis's writings in recent years about holiness mm -hmm. and in some of his homilies, I mean, he doesn't necessarily name Thomas Merton, but um, it's it's for those of us familiar with Merton's work, it's it's the resonances are so strong. I mean, I would, I'd be hard pressed uh, to to disprove that Merton wasn't. <laughs> somehow connected. So uh, you can't kind of prove a negative, but if I had an opportunity to ask Pope Francis, um, that's something that's on my list. He also talked about um, both of these figures have have a, a real appreciation for what I call in one chapter of the book, evangelical poverty or gospel poverty. Um, you know, Thomas Merton as a Trappist monk professed a vow of, of poverty. It's one of the essential four vows of Cistercian life. Um, Pope Francis himself as a Jesuit would have also professed a vow of evangelical poverty. Um, each in a different era in different ways lives it out in their own context, but they both have a, a sense of, of how this virtue is a like largely misunderstood, right? Misunderstood by most people and even by religious, um, professional <laughs> religious, as well, the professed religious. And, um, and then, and the second thing follows from that sense of, of universal holiness that they also believe that this notion of evangelical poverty going back to Jesus's preaching and model and the gospel is something not for a select few, not just for nuns and priests and monks and religious, but for all the baptized. So um, that's another area where they really align. Um, and I, I would say, you know, a, a third one is the centrality of creation in their thinking. Um, you know, Robert, you and I are having a conversation about a week's time ahead of Pope Francis's release of um, the the new exhortation, which is being billed as a sort of follow-up to let out to see. Well, Thomas Merton, near the end of his life, certainly from the mid-60s onward um, to his unfortunate death in, in December of 68, you know, had a growing, what I call like paradise or ecological consciousness. He was reading um, Rachel Carlson in the Silent Spring. He was dialoguing with people. He was living in the hermitage out in the kind of periphery of the monastic grounds in the woods surrounded by the more than human uh, creaturely world and, and was reflecting on this in deep, deep and profound ways. And so though Merton didn't write as much about creation and humanity's place within it, um, as Pope Francis certainly has with Laudato Si, this forthcoming exhortation and, and his other uh, addresses and, and, and remarks, there's never, nevertheless another kind of resonance there. And so if we read them kind of beside one another, <clears throat> and form one another, I think they have a lot to offer us today. Uh, Merton wasn't, you know, it, it was really kind of before the the new uh, era of, of ecology and certain concern about climate change, but he 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 did definitely in all of his writings have this deep sense of connection to nature, uh, and to the, the natural world, uh, and a critique of of kind of modern civilization that had uh, blunted you know our awareness or our sensitivity to in relation to to uh, creation and uh, that kind of um, 
sense of the lost paradise of Eden, you know, that that uh, has to be part of our our kind of conception of spirituality. Uh, I was thinking also, you know, that uh, <clears throat> that you know Merton went through this kind of change in his uh, approach to spirituality after years in the in the monastery. He went there, kind of uh, seeking this way of holiness by way of of uh, the silent life and this kind of medieval uh, monastic uh, discipline and asceticism. Uh, and then at a certain point, he went through this kind of change where he moved toward a sense of holiness that has to be or spirituality connected to compassion and and solidarity with with the world. And I, I think that's another strong connection with with Pope Francis and his understanding of holiness. I think that's exactly right. And um, I'm smiling because I'm, I'm teaching a, uh, a graduate seminar on on Merton and uh, his his <clears throat> themes of justice uh, at the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I know you and I have a mutual friend and their former president, uh, Father Ron Rollheiser. Uh, both of us have spoken there many times over the years. It's a great place. Um, and I was talking just this past weekend with my my doctoral students about how do we think about these moments of conversion, particularly in Merton's life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and are they as clear cut as they seem? Um, and there's some interesting conversations around this that again, makes Merton very relatable, you know, cause you can see uh, to use a metaphor, Merton loves seeds, right? These like little like possibilities and, and, and uh, kind of little themes that appear earlier in his work during this time that so often uh, categorized as, as you rightly said, as the sort of in time of enclosure, time of contemplation and solitude, a kind of in the spirit of the desert uh, fathers and mothers, this fuga mundi, right? Fleeing the world as he romantically thought of it. He's going to leave this world of aspiring to be a novelist and a famous writer and go into the anonymity of monastic life. And as luck would have it, the abbot said, well, no, you're very talented as a writer, keep writing. And then he ends up with this like runaway bestseller, global bestseller in the Seven Story Mountain. Um, but you're right that for a number of years, he he was really focused on kind of what we might call individual spirituality, individual spiritual growth, Christian discipleship, conversion, and that he um, has an experience that's oftentimes identified as a particular date, actually March 18th, 1958, where he's running some errands uh, in downtown Louisville, Kentucky, He's at the corner of 4th Street and Walnut Street and uh, has what is sometimes referred to as an epiphany. He has this sort of mystical experience where he sees his connectedness to all women and men and children, all people of the world. Uh, and he sees folks just going about their business and he he has, an, has a way of kind of seeing their holiness and their dignity and value as God sees them. And he has this beautiful line where he says, um, you know, it's like they're all walking around shining like the sun. Mm -hmm. If only we could see each other that way, you know, and mm -hmm. kind of muses about this. And then three years later, interestingly enough, he writes a letter to, again, I, I can't help in talking with you, Robert, about Dorothy. And so he writes a letter to Dorothy Day where, it, among other things, he says, you know, as good as these kind of meditative and, and monastic texts have been, he feels as though he can't keep writing those. And the line that he he offers her, he says, he says I need to deal with the life and death issues of the day. And mm -hmm. so that that's a kind of a moment of a turn. So like the late 50s, early 60s, he, he's seeing the connection between contemplation and action between uh, Christianity and justice and in, in much more overt ways. Yeah, you know, he he says it's like um, awakening from a dream of separateness, you know, yes. and he's sort of entering into the to the world, and and that that involved his uh, exploration of of uh, you know non-Western religions uh, you know, right up to the time of his death, but also in one of the you know the aspects of your book is a major part is his engagement with uh, social issues of the world, social justice, peace, and uh, and racism. And uh, all of those extremely relevant, but in the last few years, there has been, you know, similarly in this country, a kind of awakening, uh, at least during, you know, 2020, the, the Black Lives Matter kind of awakening there that we had, uh, where suddenly Merton's voice uh, seemed extremely prophetic, prescient, and, and, and relevant. Uh, uh, that's one of the interesting parts of your book that you spend so much time on that, on that particular theme. Yeah, it's, it's been a, an area of, of <laughs> real, um, of real interest and, and passion on on my part, 
Um, I had I had been interested in Merton's writings on on civil rights and uh, and race for for a long time, and then of course um, the experience that we had simultaneously this, this pandemic of COVID nineteen and the global shutdown coinciding with as you say a kind of awakening that it, that happened especially in the United States after the tragic murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis that there was this response. Uh, with what Pope Francis has called another pandemic, a pandemic mm -hmm. of, of uh, racism, systemic racism, um, and that for, for white folks in the U.S. context in particular, this was um, a real reckoning, a real kind of um, call to uh, attention, a call to um, examination of conscience. And so um, I, I found that, as you, as you said, Merton was, was very present. Merton was, was really ahead of his time very prophetic, not just simply in his way of, of kind of saying something that would, for instance, come true decades later, because it was as true then as it is now and vice versa, mm -hmm. but rather prophetic mm -hmm. in the sense that he was able to see the world in its reality. He was able to kind of see through um, the kind of self narrations and, and lies that particularly, you know, white cisgender men like Thomas Merton, who also was a it was something of a household name and a literary celebrity and a cleric, somebody who benefited from so many intersecting privileges. He had a, a very distinctive ability to kind of cut through um, all, all the kind of charades and, and uh, delusions and distractions to get to the heart of the matter. And so in one of the chapters, I talk about um, something that Merton says very explicitly in several points of his writings on race relations, on civil rights, on anti-racism which is upset some people who look like me, other white folks, which Merton himself was. He said, racism is a white problem. And this is something that's been echoed by another mutual friend of ours, uh, the great moral theologian, Father Brian Massengale, Fordham University, who in an interview after George Floyd's murder said, you know, very strikingly, you know, if racism were a black problem in the United States, it would have been solved 400 years ago. <laughs> yeah. The fact that things haven't changed is because those who benefit from the system, even obliquely, even, you know, unwittingly, um, have to want it to change, have to surrender the, the sort of power, the privileges, the comfort that comes with that. And so on the one hand, I think, you know, I appreciate you raising this up because there are several essays in here where, um, in this book where I, I try to unpack a little bit more, not just um, Merton's writings on, on race and civil rights, which are really ahead of his time in the 1960s and sadly continue to be ahead of a lot of church yeah. leaders and certainly Catholic or Christian writing today, but also to invite us to think about some of the ways in which Merton himself, as, as insightful as he was, as clear-sighted as he was, might still not have been as self-critical or self-reflecting um, as he could have been. And so that's a model for us as well, again, the relatability of Merton, that, that we're capable of seeing these things and doing something about it and integrating our faith into action. But that also calls for personal transformation and examination along the way. Well, let's think a little bit about this question of, you know, here's Merton who lived his, his life in, the, in an enclosed monastery. He, almost never left except toward the very end of his life and the last few years actually living as a hermit uh what enabled him to uh see the outside world uh so prophetically so clearly uh with such a sharp kind of uh, insight and analysis yeah that is the question right i get this a lot you know some of it's even just simply about knowledge acquisition like how did merton even know about these things if he was <laughs> living in a shack in the woods you know <laughs> Um, part of that's no, answer. No, no internet or anything. You know? No internet. Yeah, not. He had a radio that he sometimes listened to, but but it was mostly um, if he listened to anything that was recorded, it was on on a record player, and so mm -hmm. um, no television, no internet. Um, so I mean, part of that's answered by his massive correspondence. So he's in dialogue with all kinds of figures, public figures, literary figures, um, other religious leaders, civil rights leaders. Um, and so he's getting information, peace, peace and justice activists as well. He, so he's getting a lot of information. He has visitors as, as well that are coming to him. But um, I think there are two ways to think about it. One is maybe a little esoteric. And so for, for any of the academic types listening to, to this, I, this might be relevant. And one's maybe a little bit more, um, you know, kind of accessible. But but the, the, the esoteric 
d description, I think, or answer comes from what I think post-colonial theorists have talked about over the last 20, 30 years about what it means to have a different way of seeing the world from the margins. And, and one theorist in particular talks <clears throat> about a, a surplus sort of meaning, like this, this surplus sort of perspective that precisely because you're not at the center, the power center, the, the control center, the, the center of wealth, the center of influence, of status, that mm -hmm. being on the periphery gives you just um, just a, a very different perspective. And, and that is meaningful. And, and Merton was on the periphery of, of several kind of different categories. Uh, he was on the periphery of standard American mid 20th century society, right? He was a Catholic monk. He was that by itself puts him in a, in a very uh, small class of people. He was somebody even within the monastery who was at the literal periphery of the monastery grounds at this point in the hermitage. So he's living a, a life of increasing solitude. Um, he's on the periphery in terms of, of multiple identities that come together. He is at this point a naturalized American citizen, but he was born in France, studied for much of his young life in England, um, has this sort of global and, and joint sort of perspective. So he's bringing a lot of different views um, together in his own lived experience, but also through the people that he's in relationship with and friends with. Um, but then the more accessible way to describe this, I, I always like quoting um, my my good friend, David Golomboski, who's a political theorist. Uh, he wrote an article about Merton about 15 years ago, and it, it's, it's one of my favorite titles of an article. He said, simply in response to this question, the title said, how Thomas Merton pitched in by dropping out, mm -hmm. and that precisely by kind of moving out of the mainstream, mm -hmm. um, he, he has this marginal or surplus view that allows him to see with greater clarity, you know, both the truth and the untruths of, of society. And he's, he's fond of talking about this. He talks about truth and untruth a lot in those later works um, and has a lot to say. You, you mentioned technology. We can talk about social issues, justice issues, um, but he's also pretty critical of the media, even though he's not deeply steeped in it in the way that we are today. Mm -hmm. um, not, not in a conspiracy theorist sort of critique of the media, but a critique of mass media in the most literal sense, that if, if, if everybody is basically hearing the same thing from the same source, then we're all just sort of being indoctrinated in one way of thinking. And so by pitching in, by dropping out, he's, he's not thinking with the, with the whole group in the same way. And I think that's, that's a real gift to the church. It's a real gift to society. One of the things you write about it, which I, I really like, is I guess you pick up from Merton, is this idea of an apostolate of friendship. Yeah. Um, and how does that figure in his his life? Well, I think it picks up on what we were just talking about. Yeah. So that phrase is is original to Merton. It comes from a letter he wrote to Pope John the Twenty Third, now Saint John the Twenty Third, um, and this was right around between the announcement of the council and the opening of the council. So they were correspondence, um, you know, uh, in, in that period, very, very important period in church history. And um, at one point, Merton's sharing with, with John the 23rd that, you know, he's this cloistered monk, he's, his abbot doesn't really let him go get out very much. Um, he's, mm -hmm. you know, moving and, and desiring to move into greater and greater eremitical life, hermitage kind of life. At this point, he's, he's, been given permission to kind of spend some of his day in a hermitage, but he's he's living in the monastery full time. And he talks about how he sees this increasing correspondence, right? He's writing to all kinds of people, you know, tens of thousands of letters over his short lifetime to people as famous as John the 23rd or the Kennedys or Paul the Six or uh, Chet Shlomo. <laughs> great um, uh, Nobel laureate and, and among others. And, and he's also writing to like high school students who, who write to him, you know, for, like for a, a school project or, you know, there's some of his most important um, kind of expressions and, and, and thinking that gets kind of, I would say, concentrated appear in letters to like anonymous religious. There's one, you know, woman religious sister, religious sister he's writing to, um that we don't know her name it's just not recorded he he just addresses her by kind of like sister first name with with no other context and anyways all of this is to say that he's telling john the 23rd that he sees this as part of his ministry it's an apostolate and that that part of how he understands his vocation 
is not just as a critic with a surplus kind of location view or as a Roman Catholic cleric who's meant to kind of repeat a catechism or something, uh, nor does he see himself as primarily uh, a kind of uh, just war or, or peacemaking activist or anti-racist activist, but he sees uh, this notion of relationship as central to his call. And so mm -hmm. we see that carryover maybe in the in the years after that experience in downtown Louisville, where he sees everybody walking like the sun, shining like the sun, um, that carries over to his own understanding that the letters and the conversations he has with people is is a form of ministry, which which mm -hmm. I think is really quite moving. Mm -hmm. Well, he died in in uh, December 1968 in uh, Bangkok. He was at a conference on on uh, monasticism. Uh, and he went on this kind of last, his, his first real journey outside of the monastery, and he dies there very suddenly. Uh, so it's a, it's a journey that was cut short. Uh, where do you see him, the kind of trajectory of, of his, his life there uh, toward the end, if you can say anything about that? It's, it's, it would be purely counterfactual, sadly, um, but... <laughs> I think there are a couple areas where he was continuing to to deepen his uh, attention and deepen his his focus. One of those is something we talked about already, which was creation. Right? He he died just <clears throat> as the sort of modern, uh, at least in the North American context, the modern ecological movement was was emerging. Mm -hmm. And so he did read Silent Spring. He writes about um, Rachel Carson's insights. Um, he writes again about his own experiences in the more than human world. And so I think I think we would have seen a lot more of Merton's attention turned toward uh, theologies of creation, what we call today eco-spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, I also think gender would have been something on his on his radar. He dies in 68. 68 is famously a, a year of great uh, kind of turmoil um, politically, socially, academically in North America and in Europe. Um, we know of all of the things that were going on in the 60s, um, you know, from from a governmental level, but also in an inter uh, international level. And I think, you know, one of the things that was happening at this time, too, that was just coming into the fore was what's now referred to as second wave feminism. So one of the the real, I would say, stumbling blocks, I think, today for me personally, but I think for for lots of folks in reading Merton is that because he died in 1968, a lot of his language is dated. And so um, in his wonderful, magnificent work, um, deeply rich with spiritual insight, there is nevertheless sometimes gender exclusive language that can be um, inhibited for some folks. And, and it, I, I myself find it very difficult sometimes to get through, but but if you stick with it, it's, it's you know, the insights are worth it. That said, I, I've often thought that he would continue to be attentive to issues of, of peacemaking and nonviolence, as well as um, anti-racism and civil rights. But I also think the question of gender equality, the role of women in the church and in society, um, I think that would have become something that he would have been interested in. And that would have been occasioned, I think, in some part by his own personal experiences near the end of his life, too, um, which we probably don't have time to get into in, in this conversation, but, but is worth exploring mm -hmm. as well. Well, thank you. We're, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, so I just really want to thank you uh, for joining us today. I'm so excited about this book. I hope that uh, everyone uh, reads it, whether you're new to Thomas Merton or if you know, like me, if, if, you know, it's a hobby that's gotten out of control. Uh, I think you'll you'll get a lot out of this and it speaks to, so much to our, our, our time. Merton is, is such a companion and guide for so many of us. Uh, so please, it's called uh, Engaging Thomas Merton, and it certainly does. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Wonderful to talk with you today. Thank you, Robert. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate it.